my name is Joel. In this episode of Unplugged, I talk to boardroom advisor and filmmaker Rolf Winters. In search for meaning and a new perspective, Rolf traveled across the world to find the hidden wisdom keepers. For five years he resided among various tribes on every continent, together with his wife and three children. His journey resulted in the awe-inspiring hit movie Down to Earth, a movie that touched the hearts of countless people and changed lives. I visited Rolf at his home near London. We talk about his own personal journey, the insights he received from the wisdom keepers he encountered, and about how to apply these insights as a leader and entrepreneur. I was wondering, if, if you look back at your life so far, and you would divide your life in different chapter headings, what would the chapter headings be? Could be one or two or three, maybe it's even 15. I thought this was going to be an easy interview. <laughs> no, <laughs> and how many chapters? Uh, it's up oh. to you. Okay. Well, um, the first chapter is probably up to um, starting to work, um, education, growing up. Uh, if that's a chapter. Where did you grow up? I grew up in, uh, in Holland, um, studied uh, business economics um, in Tilburg University and started working in, uh, in the corporate world in an international marketing role. And sort of that would probably be the, the next chapter, sort of um, trying out a, a career, mm. a business career. Um, I, I was very much a corporate guy, I thought. I, I was really... Um, the first company I worked for was uh, Nasher in, uh, in Holland mm. and um, it, it was just a, like a warm bath. It was, uh, if I look back, still one of the most thriving cultures I've ever um, worked in. I, was, I actually witnessed mm. and um, I was with that company from when I started 200 employees to about 500 employees. So it's a nice size. And it was, and still, at that size, it still felt like one big family. And um, the company was also the most successful in their chain worldwide. It was, uh, the company had a presence in 40 countries. And so um, when it was procured by an English company, um, they looked at the stats and said, you know, there's something wrong with these uh, spreadsheets. And then they realized that we were sort of a different fish. With the result that they came to, to Holland and said, you know, what, what are you guys doing different? And we basically said, well, <coughs> we are such brilliant marketeers. And the, we know the products are not so great, but we know how to sell them. And uh, that's probably um, a part of chapter two. Mm. If we're, um, Education is chapter one. I think uh, a corporate career is chapter two, mm. um, which I started already sort of during my study when I started to work for this company. And... Um, so when we were hired by the English company to come to the head office to basically you know, duplicate our success throughout Europe and the rest of the world, um, that was chapter 2B, <laughs> because chapter 2B was seeing the backside of the corporate world. Yeah. <coughs> Working here in the head office in London was, um, was like a snake, what do you call it, a snake pit. Um, people were just fighting uh, with each other, um, clashing egos, um, the whole um, sort of toxic environment, as you can Im sometimes can imagine, that happens in the corporate world. I, I was exposed to that as in the right in the middle of it. So I saw the two extremes, basically, of the corporate world mm. in Within Chapter 2. Company. Within one company. Well, it was actually a new company that, that took over. And um, w within months, all my colleagues sort of burned up and, and disappeared. But I, I, I stayed not because I loved it, but because I was fascinated. I was fascinated by the whole process of, you know, A, how I was completely incapable of copying any of the success in the other uh, companies. Um, and how, um, how, for heaven's sake, you know, people that were very close to the business, the investors were very close to the business, didn't see how toxic uh, the environment was and how you know, in, in, in meetings, you know, millions were just like thrown in the gutter uh, to save somebody's face or whatever. Anyway, I, th I, th I was very learning, very much a learning experience. I loved the, the London life. Um, but after three and a half years, I decided this is it. And um, that's chapter three started and started to um, set up my own company. And I think it was 
definitely that experience of seeing the two extremes of the corporate spectrum um, that have brought me to that decision that I thought, you know, if, um, if this is the reality of the corporate world, you know, how nice would it be if you can actually play a part in making, turning not so healthy entities into healthy entities. I also made a decision I was not going to go for toxic mm. environments because, you know, I mean, um, if something is that sick, I think you just better move on. Uh, so I decided to work with companies that are relatively healthy, but, you know, really wanted to become uh, a spirited, highly spirited company. Mm. And what, so what made you <coughs> spirit driven? What in your life happened that you went in that, into that journey? Well, I think I started to realize how amazing these first years were and uh, how amazing people can, can work together and, and manifest something with relatively um, you know, inferior material. Um, it's a bit like you know, building a, a football team with average players and, and winning the World Cup. That, that was how this company felt. You know, we, had, we had very average products. The competition was far better, but we were number one in the market. And just because you know the the services that we managed to provide and the the connections we were able to make and the engagement we were able to create with with customers, um, so I uh, you know, basically started my my firm in what I said you know cultural culture development and that in a couple of years um, transitioned very quickly to leadership um, coaching and leadership development. Uh, I also started to see how much the two are related, you know, how a culture is definitely related to um, the attitude of the leadership. Um, I tried in the beginning to change cultures from the bottom up, but that only goes so far. Mm. You know, we still have to accept that we are in a, in a pyramid model and that uh, if you can't change the, uh, the mindset in the boardroom, um, then bottom up change um, has uh, its limitations. So, and I, I was fascinated with, uh, with leadership from day one. I also started to realize what the success really was driving, starting with in that original company, uh, that it was a, an amazing, uh, authentic leader mm. who was able to, you know, to pull people in and let them blossom in, in, uh, and grow in their own talents with their own gifts. Um, and that is, uh, I still think, one of the most fascinating things. How do people actually work together? And what can you do to, to create an energy field where people can bring in their full selves, their whole selves, without holding back? And where, um, where it's a safe place to, um, to experiment, to explore, and not work from a place of fear. And um, so, yeah, I did that for uh, 10 years. It's nice, 10-year 10, 10 mm. chapters, mm. yeah. <laughs> uh, so you were about 30 then? Yeah, I was 30. Uh, I started a company. And by the time I was 40, um, I think a new chapter had started because I became a dad, um, starting a family. I think that is definitely the beginning of, of, an, of a new journey. Mm. And um, I think that triggered me to, uh, together with my wife, to make, um, to really reflect on, you know, what it is that you contribute to the life of your children. And um, that actually uh, was a, a dialogue that didn't stop. Um, we started to look around and say, you know, how w why would we actually bring our children into a school system if we don't feel that the system is um, to be trusted? Um, you know, why would I still continue to work with corporates whilst I started to see that the corporate system in itself is failing and so in the 10 years of being in boardrooms um, you know I, I've seen a lot uh, and even though these, those were in itself healthy companies um, with great people um, you could see that at some stage a system um, manipulated uh, people to to take decisions that were not necessarily good for them not necessarily good for the people they work for and definitely not good for uh, the bigger picture. And that started to hurt more and more. Um, so by uh, the age of 40, um, my wife and I, we uh, took a decision to break away from the, 
this world altogether and mm. uh, you know experiment. Was it a difficult decision? No, I think we were looking to, to change our rhythm of life and we were trying to say, you know, I mean, uh, life goes so quick, Joel. Um, and to stay in the same groove is um, not something that we enjoy. And uh, with those bigger questions about, you know, how are we going to raise these kids and what are we going to do to to make a difference in the world. Uh, we said, you know, we can, <coughs> we can talk about these things, uh, we, can take out, uh, we can take another membership uh, beyond, uh, uh, you know, the World Nature Fund and Greenpeace and Amnesty International, but, you know, um, that, that is not enough. You know, you have to start living your life in a different way. And so when we met um, this clan of Native Americans uh, in, uh, in 2005, we realized that, you know, there, there is so much still to learn from um, people who have a completely different view on life. And we said, you know, why, why would we take a couple of years out? And that is uh, the next chapter. Uh, so we're now in chapter four. Right? Now, would you call that chapter, chapter four? Uh, <laughs> now, would I call that chapter? Um, exploring life anew. Mm. Yeah. It was definitely a completely open-ended chapter. I mean, uh, in hindsight, if you write a book, you know, you probably rename the chapters. So mm -hmm. I can rename the chapter now. Um, but it was definitely an ex ex exploration uh, of life in a, in a completely open, different way. Uh, we, we sold, a, we sold a everything. Sold the house, sold the business. We really cut the, the links that we had with the life that we were leading. And... Um, started completely anew. Uh, um, bought a piece of woodlands, you know, very different from living in the big city to living in the middle of nowhere. Uh, build a house there and, st and build a whole new life. Uh, home educated the kids. So, um, yeah, it couldn't be a bigger U-turn, I think. Mm. Uh, but the idea was to actually decondition ourselves. Mm. Because over the years we had actually seen that, you know, even though we had problems with the system, we were very much participants and part of that system. And I think that was, um, come back to your question, was it difficult? I think that was really the, the burning issue for us. You know, you can't just say, you know, look at, look at this or look at them or look at this company or look at this government or whatever. No, you have to say, you know, actually, I contribute to that every day. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, chapter four. And I think so that- you broke out <coughs> the system. Yeah. And with, with a complete open uh, idea of what it, what it could lead to. And uh, How did it feel those first few years of living in the middle of nowhere? It was in the States, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a, complete, um, a complete sense of freedom. I mean, I also had to let go of identity because I hadn't realized how much I had identified with what I had created, the company had created, uh, the work I was doing. Um, I was speaking many events, uh, I was doing leadership quests, and, um, and all of a sudden, you know, when you, when you break that, um, uh, people forget about you very quickly. You know, the, the, the inbox and emails uh, was reduced to 20 to 10 to three emails after a couple of months, and then, you know, it's like, Oh, that's interesting. So, what really, for who really am I, and mm. what, how important was that identity and that um, recognition? Um, because then you're in the middle of the woods, and you're just a human in the middle of the woods, with no badge, with no nothing. Uh, you are a dad. You know that's the most important thing. You are, you know, part of a family, and you're part of this bigger family that we were part of, and. So it was, a, it was a tremendous shift. Um, another big, big uh, realization was that I thought I was always living very much in the moment. Uh, but I realized there how much actually I was always thinking of the next thing. You know, what's the next project? What's the next activity? What's the next challenge? And that wasn't there because it wasn't the next thing. Um, the next day, yeah, we had to still produce food and you know educate the kids but it was a very much a day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and uh, so the whole rhythm of life the whole concept of how you live your life 
was completely, completely different. And uh, that's a very refreshing exercise. Mm. So how long is that chapter? Well, I think I'm still in that chapter. Um, but we, um, if we made the chapters more geographical, we, we, um, we, w we were away for five years. Mm. And um, so that's chapter 4A, and I think we're now in chapter 4B. You know, we're still in this sort of exploring state. Um, I think we never go back to, um, to a conventional lifestyle. Um, we both feel very strongly um, how important it is to stay open to what can uh, emerge. And uh, I think the, how we have been infected by um, the Native American spirit of, you know, um, living as a, as a small part of the bigger whole and, and being open to what uh, presents itself um, is something that we, I think, will never uh, step away from. Mm. Um, but doing that here is a whole different um, challenge than doing it, you know, back in the woods or even when we were traveling. Uh, to live a sort of a connected life and living that, that sort of conscious life um, was far easier when you live in nature, when you, when you have to, this different rhythm of life. But then coming back here and trying to implement that way of living um, has been quite challenging since we came back. Yeah. What are then the main challenges? Um, well, you know, you, you have to participate. You, you can't just um, build a wall around you. I mean, you could. But that also is, um, I think that wouldn't be that wouldn't be part of this sort of open lifestyle. So, you you want to participate in whatever community you're part of, um, but that means that you you you're receptive to all these elements that society brings in. Um, we're children educating children. We had complete freedom how to educate our kids. We had nothing to nobody to. Um, to report to, um, we just um, intuitively, um, you know, I mean, we did a lot of research, but we made our decisions how we thought we should educate our kids um, about what we exposed them to, what we didn't expose them to when we bring them here into school. I mean, we've tried to pick the best possible school, but still you have to accept that, you know, people do things in a different way that you might not um, necessarily relate to. So is it compromising? I think it's more accepting that you can't just create your own world completely as we did in those five years that we lived in the woods. Um, that's one aspect. Um, but more importantly, I think, uh, is that, uh, you know, you want to, we wanted to bring back our life, so we want to bring back so what we had learned into this world. And then, you know, you actually, you're hitting the walls and the, the constraints of the, of the system and the conditioned mindsets that um, are being created all the time. And uh, yeah, if you then also want to uh, play an active role in the, in the change that you want to see in the world, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's maybe, the, maybe the next chapter. Uh, I don't know when it started. It's, it gradually um, came upon us when we uh, decided to document um, the experience that we'd had. And um, so we released a, a film two and a half years ago, as you know, in, in Holland. And um, yeah, from that moment on, you're actually in, in the picture and, and, and right into the system again. Then to still keep up that lifestyle uh, has been an incredible challenge. Yeah. So maybe we're in chapter five now. Mm. What would you call chapter five? Craziness. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking chaos. But it's yeah, chaos. Yeah, I was thinking of chaos. Um, it's not just chaos, but um, it's been the most challenging part of my life, the, the recent years. Hmm. Um, because uh, at one end, what we're trying to bring into the world, I didn't feel like I was living that every day anymore. So that started to feel uh, sort of bittersweet. Hmm. So what is it that you're trying to bring into the world? Well, 
Well, that's, uh, I just want to share what we experienced uh, by breaking away. That we have, I think, lost track a little bit of who we really are. And, and being and humanity. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite big, if you think about it. Mm. You know, but for me, there's no doubt in my mind that we have lost our path collectively as humanity. And that we're living in a very, very um, important time. Also a very exciting time. I mean, this was the beautiful thing as well. When, when you speak to my Native American friends, they will tell you we're living in the most exciting time of mankind. You know, and we're actually, we actually part of it. You know, the, the biggest transformational shift that, that mankind has seen. And it's not, you know, it's not the technology that's changing, but it's really the, you know, the changing consciousness that we, that we ride in, that we, that we see in this moment. Uh, so what am I trying to bring out? You know, that we, I think we have to, we have to go back. We have to really slow down and, and um, ask ourselves um, what we're doing here, you know, and, and what, what responsibility we carry for future generations. Um, when I met the Native Americans for the first time, and they said, well, what, what, what's your frustration? You seem frustrated. I said, well, my frustration is that I'm doing wonderful work. But whatever I'm doing, um, you know, the, the short-term thinking in the corporate world where I am, and basically in the world in general, is basically, you know, killing everything that we're trying to um, protect. And um, I said, you know, the, the horizon for decisions is one year, two years out. Two years is long term. And he said, uh, the chief said at the moment, he said, um, well, do you know that we as leaders of uh, our communities, every decision that we take has to be good for the next seven generations. And I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of different. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's not, it's real. It's real. They, they, they are connected seven generations ahead and seven generations back. That's it. That's where it all starts. You know, it's a completely different look of, of who we are and how we are connected to, to life and to, um, you know, th this, this per perception of time that we have, this perception of what we are to do here, the perception of, of life and death um, is very different, not just there, but in all the indigenous communities that we have encountered. Mm. So if you, if you see that life is just an ongoing cycle, um, you know, you, you, you have a very different attitude towards everything and everything that you touch and everything you do in life. And I think because we have lost that way of looking at, you know, who we are, where we come from, and where we're going, um, I think that has really screwed us up. So, you know, we can talk about sustainability and, you know, we can talk about SDGs and it's, it's all very important. Um, but if we still do that with the same kind of mindset, it's just, you know, it's just tinkering with, uh, with the, the levers that we have. Mm. Um, I think the most important thing to uh, make sure that we are not, on this, not longer on the ram course, uh, which we are, you know, there's, fortunately there's no doubt about it anymore. Uh, when, when we started our journey in 2000, uh, beginning, beginning of the new millennium, you know, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of debate. You know, how real is the threat? And you know, people just couldn't see the couldn't see the problem. Um, I think that at least that at least has changed. But to to change it with the same mindset, it's not gonna it's not gonna work. So it's really about changing the the whole underlying sense of who we are and how we look at life. Mm. And um, in that sense, I think you know we have a. We have a beautiful experience to share um, that is shared amongst basically all the, the tribal, uh, all the natural living people of the mm. world. Um, and um, we have to ask ourselves why do they still live in a, in a sustainable way and we with all our evolvement and all our knowledge and all our technology can't. During your five-year
travels around the world, you met many wisdom keepers. What do you think is for you personally the most important thing that they that you've learned from them? Hmm. One thing. Yeah, there's a there's a range of things. I mean, we try to we try to answer this question with a 90-minute film, and now mm. you want one thing. <laughs> In 20 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds. No, okay. the mo maybe no. the most important thing, so is there an, some kind of essence to it? Well, the essence on a personal level um, is actually very, very basic. And that is that we, we are born with a compass um, that we have forgotten to use. And... Um, we have created an, a navigation tool that we think is a navigation tool that resides up here, which is totally inadequate um, to navigate us through life. And that we have been given this compass that we, that we all have, that c we can use in any situation. Um, it's, uh, it's weatherproof, it's, uh, it's circumstance proof. But can you still connect with it? Um, I think that's still probably one of the most powerful and important messages uh, that we can learn from these people. You know, we've, be, we've become walking heads. And everything in our society is geared towards um, our rational mind, especially in this age of technology. Um, interestingly, you know, I was at a conference about sort of the with 200 change makers from around the world. And um, it was sort of trying to find out the most important questions of our time, and, you know, trying how we can, how can we manifest change? And we spent a week on a boat together. And um, there was a lot of people talking about AI being the solution. And um, so I find it's interesting, you know, that people think, you know, the more we actually keep working on this, on this, path of progress of becoming smarter and, and you know creating even ever evolving technologies that that will ultimately solve our problems uh, I have a serious doubts about that well actually it's not doubts I just feel that that's not going to be bringing the solution mm -hmm. you know I think that technology will pay, play a big part in creating solutions but it's 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 our spirit and our connectedness that can combine with our intelligence um, we can we can solve every anything um, but taking you that part out you take you take the heart you take the spirit out of things um, then you know we will just keep going in this dark hole that um, is out there like we said before you know mm. that's that's a that's a real possibility what would you call the compass? Is it your heart or your intuition? I think it's everything from the from the neckline down, basically. So everything but your mind. I think so. You know, there's people talk. You know, we have to live from our heart. We have to trust our gut. We have to trust our intuition. We have to, you know, be in touch with our spirit. Um, all these things are related with one another, but it's our whole sensing ability. <coughs> you know, everything that we. Um, that we can feel, that we can sense, that we are in connection with. Um, that is very much how all these people live by. That's what's basically helping to, to make the real decision in life. I mean, we have a mind because we have to know how we, where we park the car, you know, how we pay our bills, you know, how we, how we um, fix something. But it's like, that's just a processor. That's not a tool that can navigate. That's not our compass. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is what we, are being told all the time, you know, the more we analyze, you know, and we we get statistics and we get uh, more knowledge and we get more experiences and, you know, we put everything on the table and then we can make the perfect decision. Well, guess what? Have you tried it? Hmm. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. No, it seems to work for a little while, but, you know, you, 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 you lose track of what it is that you're here to do. And so... Um, yeah, I think that is, um, you, say, you say, how do we do it? Um, it's basically stop running. You know, they say it literally in the film, you know, we have to stop running. 
we have to stop, you know, being in this in this rat race, in this treadmill of you know doing more and um, attaining more knowledge. I mean, in my work with, with coaching leaders, um, the most difficult cases are the people who have read all the books, that have done all the trainings, because they they're trying to to follow these pathways that other people have described for them, forgetting that you know the the real leadership is from within, mm -hmm. outward. I mean, if we talk about the, the leadership ideas that these people have and, and the leaders that the, these communities choose, it's the total opposite of the way we do it in our society. The total opposite. You know, we're looking at the smartest people in the educational system. You know, they get a certain grade. Then we put these smart people together in a room and we see, you know, who comes out on top. And, um, you know, the one with the, with the most sort of um, manifestation power, um, with the strongest personality, then gets a top job. And that's sort of a crown on a career. Um, in this process, we created, it's very difficult not to create a big ego. Very difficult. Um, it's also, uh, you know, we put so much value into what they can think of is the right way. Um, that's a very different way that how leadership originally was meant to be. I mean, leadership is to lead a community for and, and serving the greater good. If leaders in any indigenous communities are recognized at a young age, nobody's happy to be recognized as a leader because they know it's a lifelong in service for mm -hmm. the community. So it starts with responsibility and it ends with responsibility as well. And it's not a, it's not a job. It's not a role. It's a way of life. And you're always in service of the community, not just this community, but also the generations ahead. Um, <coughs> that means that you know there's very different different type of people that they also, uh, um, you know, select, and how people are nurtured is also completely different. It's actually you know just raising them with certain values and um, understanding of our part in the bigger picture. Um, the whole way that leaders are raised in indigenous communities is about actually not letting the ego get away and not letting the ego emerge too much, but actually, you know, create humility and um, this sense of service. I mean, how different can it get? Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look at uh, the young people that are recognized, it's actually the, the people that are recognized as leaders in the indigenous community are the ones that are actually squashed in our school system. Mm. They don't even manage to get through often. And we have to ask ourselves, wh why would they choose the highly sensitive ones as future leaders? Why would they do that? The ones that actually you know, have a hard time coping in our system because they're so sensitive. So, so if, if, if we make this practical in a Western boardroom, uh, let me state it differently. If we make wisdom-based leadership practical, what, what, what would it look like in, in the boardroom? Well, um, very different than the way um, many boardrooms are uh, looking and feeling like now. Um, when you look at the position of the, of the leader, um, he or she is often seen as the one that has the answers or has the ideas or knows where to go. Um, they've been given a lot of... Um, the expectation of leaders in our world today is that um, they're sort of the smartest person in the room. They know, they know where to take an organization. They know what's good um, for the organization and its stakeholders. Um, so they um, have a focus on um, you know, creating a strategy and realizing a certain result um, uh, related to that strategy. Um, in a world of wisdom-based leadership, um, there is a, there's a shared goal, there's a shared vision of where we want to go. Uh, but the one thing that the leader knows for sure is that he or she has no exact idea 
how to manifest that vision. Um, yet he or she has a very clear idea um, what the most optimal process is of bringing people together and um, letting people flourish and letting things unfold um, that you can't even imagine in the, in the moment where you are now what um, you know, the day after tomorrow is going to look like. So from a, a focus, uh, a converging focus, is actually is actually the most important role for a leader is to open things up. So in the way that he or she leads their team is not to say, you know, these are the results and we're going to see, you know, how far have we come. Um, because, you know, our plan was holy and we're going to execute on a plan. Um, this whole idea of about having a plan is actually quite uh, pretentious and kind of arrogant in a, in a world where change is uh, the only certainty. Um, so it has to be much more in the moment and that basically every meeting, you know, you have an openness to new things that kind of come to the table. And there's always this understanding that everybody that's in that room is kind of equal. Um, not that people have different roles, you know, a leader has a, a role to bring things together and, you know, to to hold the space for the team. But the members should be feel much freer to actually divert from a plan or to experiment and to bring in new things that actually have come to the table since uh, since the last meeting um, without fear for, um, you know, uh, being seen as not loyal to the plan. Um, so it's it's really a, um, a very different way of the focusing on uh, trusting the process and trusting that if you bring the right people in the room and you um, you follow your gut about where something uh, doesn't feel right rather than following your mind and say we had said ABC and now we're going to check if it's still ABC. Um, the whole energy completely transforms. So is your role as a leader your role to actually set out a strategy, follow the plan, execute and control? Or is your role something completely different and say we have a shared vision but I'm actually going to f follow my gut and see where are people actually creating uh, new ideas, where are people actually finding this ball of creativity? Because ultimately, you know, that's, that's, our, that's our gift. That's what we, these are the two big resources that we actually lead. It's creativity and energy. And they're replenishable resources. Now people are usually working with just those two, um, you know, conventional resources. You have a, a bucket of time and a bucket of money. You have so many people and you have so much budget. And that's, that's your resources. Well, that's a very uh, rudimentary way of, of looking at, at your resources. Mm. So if leaders think that they are there to manifest the bottom line by focusing on results, <coughs> I think they, they live in the old days. Um, also because the young people that come aboard, they understand that this is not a way of living. This is not understand, uh, a way of, of, of manifesting. Um, I think, you know, there's a whole new generation of people that um, doesn't want to make money here and then spend it there and have a good time or doing something purposeful. They want it all included. And, you know, that's what we have to offer to them. And if we can't offer that within five to ten years, those companies will be gone, however big they are. You have to bring the whole package together, and that's what you have to, um, that's your responsibility. Um, so you know, the, the amount you pay is not going to compensate for that. Great stuff. <laughs>